I'm here to talk about success. The first rule of success is to have a vision. You see, if you don't have a vision of where you go and if you don't have a goal where you go, you drift around and you never end up anywhere. It's like you can have the best ship in the world, you can have the best airplane in the world. If the pilot or the captain doesn't know where to go, it will just drift around. It will not end up anywhere or most likely in the wrong place. So I was very fortunate that I stumbled onto my vision. I mean, as you know, I was born in 1947 in Austria after the Second World War. And I didn't really like Austria when I grew up. I couldn't wait to get out of there. I couldn't see myself becoming a farmer or a worker in a factory or anything like that. Even though my parents wanted me to stay there and have a normal life. My father wanted me to become a police officer like he was. My mother wanted me just to stay there and marry a girl with the name of Heidi, hopefully, <laughs> and have a bunch of kids and run around like the Van Trapp family in the sound of music. But that was their vision, not mine. My vision was totally different. I felt that I was born for something special, for something unique, for something big. So I was searching. Then one day I went to school, I remember I was 11 years old, and they showed a documentary about America. And there they showed in this documentary the huge skyscrapers, the high rises, the huge bridges, the six lane freeways, the huge cars with the wings sticking out, and all of this stuff in the same stuff. That's where I want to be. I don't want to be around here with these little farmhouses and these little buildings and everything is old. I want to be in America. But now the question was just how do you get to America? In those days, it was a very expensive trip. It's not like today. So again, very fortunate. I was very fortunate that one day after school, I walked by a store in Graz, which was called Brühl. And it was the only store that really sold kind of American stuff. So one day, they had jeans there, American jeans. And then they had the bullwalker. And then they had an expander. And some barbells and some dumbbells and an exercise bench in the window. So I went inside and I looked around and I looked at this stuff and then I saw a magazine. I saw a bodybuilding magazine that had Reg Park on the cover. Reg Park was then a three-time Mr. Universe. And I saw him on the big screen as Hercules. And on the cover it said, how Reg Park, Mr. Universe, became the Hercules star. That's what the cover story was all about. So I looked at the cover and I said, myself, I got to get this magazine. So I bought the magazine, I took it home and I read it over and over from the front page to the back. It had everything in there, how he trained, how he was working out in Leeds, England, in a factory town, how he worked out every day for three, four hours and became the strongest man of Europe, and how he won Mr. Europe, and Mr. Great Britain, and then eventually Mr. Universe, and how he won the second Mr. Universe and the third Mr. Universe, and how he was discovered to play the starring role in Hercules. I read that and I said to myself, wow, this is the blueprint for my life. This is exactly what I want to do. I want to become a bodybuilding champion just like Reg Park. I want to get into movies just like Reg Park. And I want to make millions of dollars and be rich and famous just like Reg Park. Do you know how great it felt that I knew where I was going? Imagine the majority of people don't know where they're going. I knew where I was going, that I'm going to become this bodybuilding champion just like him. So it was just a question of how do you do it? I was so relieved because when you have a goal, when you have a vision, everything becomes easy. Because remember that 
In America, for instance, when you study, you will see the percentage of people that like their jobs. 74% hate their job in America. Now, there is not much different when you come to Europe. The majority of people don't like what they're doing because they're really not doing it because they didn't have a goal and they followed this goal. They just aimlessly drift around and then all of a sudden they, there's a job opening so they get that job because you have to work. But then when you work, it's a chore. It's work. It's not fun. So if you think about only a quarter of the people really enjoy what they're doing in life, that is unbelievable if you think about it. So I felt so blessed that I knew what I was doing. It's like a medical student that studies and knows he wants to become a doctor. You know where to go. So I knew where to go. So people always ask me, when they saw me in the gym in the pumping iron days, they said, why is it that you're working out so hard, five hours a day, six hours a day, and you have always a smile on your face? The others are working out just as hard as you do, and they look sour in the face. Why is that? And I told people all the time, I said, because to me, I am shooting for a goal. In front of me is the Mr. Universe title. So every rep that I do gets me closer to accomplishing that goal, to make this goal, this vision, turn into reality. Every single set that I do, every repetition, every weight that I lift will get me a step closer to turn this goal into reality. So I couldn't wait to do another 500-pound squat. I couldn't wait to do another 500-pound bench press. I couldn't wait to do another 2,000 reps of sit-ups. I couldn't wait for the next exercise, for the next half hour of posing and all the kind of things that you have to do to be a champion. I felt so great knowing where I was going, and I tell you, it worked. I mean, think about it. In the end, I was just not visualizing just my exercise, but I was really lifting the trophy over my head. That's what I was thinking about. And with the age of 20, with the age of 20, I went to London and I won the Mr. Universe contest as the youngest Mr. Universe ever. And it was because I had a goal. And this is no different than anything else, what I'm talking about. This is not just about bodybuilding. It was the same in acting. I remember when I was doing Conan the Barbarian. I was crawling on the rocks with a sword in my arm, crawling on all four. And of course, being that it's Conan, I didn't have clothes on or anything like that, right? So I was kind of, my knees were bare, my elbows were bare and everything else. And I'm crawling on the rocks. So after 10 takes, my elbows were bleeding and my knees were bleeding. And the director came to me and he said, Arnold, I'm so sorry that you have to go through this, but we need one more take, a close-up of you crawling with the sword towards the camera. Can you handle one more take? And I said to him, I don't know what you're talking about. He says, I'm totally fine. He says, but you're bleeding. I said, because I don't feel it because I can visualize what the scene will look like in a film. And I'm so excited about this scene. I was visualizing crawling up behind false doom, which was played by James Earl Jones crawling up behind Falsa Doom with the sword slowly, and then rising up behind him, and whack, cutting his head off. And the head spins in the air, slowly with blood all over the place, and slowly falls down the steps and rolls down the steps. And his body slowly falls sideways. That was what I was visualizing, and that was very important because he, in the movie, killed my parents, killed Conan's parents. And that was revenge. And he always said that flesh is stronger than steel. 
And I wanted to prove to him that no, steel is stronger than flesh. And so I had this in my mind. And so this is why it didn't matter if I had to do another 50 takes or 100 takes, no matter how much I bleed on my elbows or my knees, I saw that vision of the perfect scene and it was an important scene and I would do it over and over again until we got it. And the same thing is also in politics. I remember that in politics, I had a very clear vision that I will be the leader of California. This as far as I could go because I was not born in America, so I could not run for president. So being the governor of the fifth largest state, of, I should say the largest state, the fifth largest economy in the world, was for me really the ultimate title the ultimate accomplishment in politics. So even though people came up to me and said, why don't you go and run for something smaller? You're never going to make it. I ran for governor, and then two months later, I became governor of the state of California. Again, because I had a very clear vision what I'm going to do with California. So let me tell you something. Visualizing your goal and going after it makes it fun. You got to have a purpose no matter what you do in life. You got to have a purpose. So that's rule number one, have a vision. Rule number two is don't listen to the naysayers. Don't listen to the naysayers. Everything I ever did, the thing that I heard out of people's mouth was that's impossible. That can't be done. Or no. I remember when I want to be a bodybuilding champion, including my parents and everyone else around me, said this is impossible. Why don't you become a ski champion? That's what they do in Austria. Or a bicycle champion to do some track and field. You can't be a bodybuilding champion. That is exactly what I heard. And of course, I proved to the people that it can't be done. So whenever someone said to me, it can't be done. I heard it can be done. When they said no, I heard yes. And when they said it's impossible, I heard it is possible. Because I am a strong believer. I'm a strong believer of what Nelson Mandela said, that everything is always impossible until someone does it. Well, I'm going to be the one, I said to myself, I'm going to do it and I'm going to show it to them. Maybe it has never been done before. That's perfectly fine with me. But I'm going to do it. And I did not listen to the naysayers. The same was also when I went into not just in bodybuilding, they said no. When I wanted to come to America, when I wanted to go to America, they said it's impossible. There's no money that you have to fly even over there. You have no money when you go over there to live with. And what do you think? They're going to wait for you? There are plenty of big bodybuilders over there. It was all no, no, and it can't be done. It's impossible. And I remember then that the same thing happened also when I went into the show business. Can you imagine? I was now a bodybuilder. I weighed 250 pounds. I was Mr. Olympia six times. I was Mr. Universe five times. I missed the world. I missed international. I won 13 world bodybuilding championships altogether. And now I said to the agent, the Hollywood agent, I want to get into movies. He said, <laughs> that's funny, Arnold. I asked a studio executive, I say, I want to get into movies. I want to be a leading man. He started laughing. So they all say it's impossible. I said, why is it impossible? He says, because look at how big you are. You weigh 250 pounds. Hercules bodies and muscular bodies weighing 20 years ago. 20 years ago, they did Machiste and they did all these uh, 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 Samson movies and Hercules movies and stuff like that, but not anymore. I know this is the 70s. Do you know the sex symbols today? It's Al Pacino. He weighs 150 pounds. 
It's Dustin Hoffman. He weighs 146 pounds. And guess who else is a sex symbol? Woody Allen. So imagine they're telling me now that those are the new sex symbols. So do you ever forget about it? And then they told me, is this, and your accent, even if you reduce all your body weight and everything and have a normal body, your accent. I said, your accent, I mean, it will go give people goosebumps with the German accent. It will get people the creeps. They will get scared. He says, no one in Hollywood ever has become a leading man that had an accent. Doesn't happen. People in America want to hear their actors talk like John Wayne or like Burt Reynolds or like Clint Eastwood. Not like someone on Hogan's Heroes or something like that. Some Nazi movie. This is the kind of stuff that they heard. They said, no, you see, it's impossible. And plus your name. Your name, who can pronounce Schwarzen Schnitzel or something like that? No one can pronounce that, so forget about it, Arnold. This is the kind of thing that I heard. Imagine, you go from studio executive to studio executive, from agent to agent, from manager to manager, and they all said exactly the same thing. Now that's very encouraging, isn't it? But you know something? I didn't give a shit. I didn't. Because I believed that I can be a leading man. I believed that I could be another Clint Eastwood or another Burt Reynolds or another Warren Beatty or whatever those characters were, Charles Bronson and so on. I believed that I could be those people. I said, there's enough room on that ladder that I can fit up there. And I looked back again and learned from what I learned in sports, in my case in bodybuilding. It's all about the hard work that you put in. I said to myself, in bodybuilding, I worked out five, six hours a day. I'm going to do the same thing now for acting. And of course, I went to college to study English. I studied, uh, studied voice, accent removal, acting classes, and all of this stuff. All day long, I worked and I worked and I worked. And within a short period of time, I made one movie called Hercules in New York, which of course went right into the toilet. But it didn't discourage me. I still had the same vision. And then all of a sudden, I did Streets of San Francisco. I did Stay Hungry and Pumping Iron and The Villain. And then all of a sudden, I was asked by Dino De Laurentiis and by Universal Studio the biggest studio, to star in Conan the Barbarian. And after I did Conan the Barbarian, the director at the press conference said to the press, the director was John Milius, he said to the press, if we wouldn't have had Arnold, we would have had to build one. So think about that. The very body that they said can never be sold because the time is wrong. A few years later, I'm doing Conan the Barbarian and it was the number one hit at the box office when it came out in the summer of 82. Think about that. And the director says, if we wouldn't have had his body, we would have had to build one. So all of a sudden, my body became an asset, not a liability. And the same thing was with Terminator. After we were finished filming Terminator, Jim Cameron said to the press, if Arnold wouldn't have had that accent and talked like a machine, I think the movie wouldn't have worked. So think about that. The body and the accent that they attacked was an asset. But I didn't listen to those losers. I didn't listen to them at all. Because that's exactly the way it was in politics again, when everyone said no, 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 and it can't be done. 
and then became governor of California, and this is with everything like that. This is just the reality of it, is, is that you cannot listen to the naysayers. So this is a very important lesson for all of you. So when someone says, no, this is a stupid idea, you in your mind, you don't have to say it, but in your mind just say to yourself, fuck you, you're an asshole. What do you know? If I would have listened to the naysayers, from bodybuilding to show business to, the, uh, to uh, politics, I would not be standing here today talking to you. I would be in Austria in the Alps yodeling. <laughs> That's right. I would be in Austria still left yodeling. That's what I would be doing exactly. So this is why I say don't listen to the naysayers. And the next thing, the third point that I'm going to make to you is, before we sit down with Jürgen and talk about the rest of the three, is work your ass off. There is no magic bill. There is no magic out there. You cannot get around. You have to work and work and work. I can tell you, I've watched the day for half an hour, Jürgen and his wife that put on this show this great, great event here. They work their ass off to, to put this together. All year long, they work and they work and they work. This does not come together by itself. For half an hour, they were running around and making phone calls and doing this and that and talking to their aides to make sure this is happening, make sure there's the water out there. Talking about water, love water. Make sure of this and make sure of that and all that stuff. So it's work. And it drives me crazy when people say that they don't have enough time to go to the gym for 45 minutes a day and work out. Or to do something for 45 minutes to an hour a day to improve. If it is physically improve or if it is mentally to improve. Imagine you read one hour a day about history. How much you will learn after 365 hours in one year. Think about if you study about the history of musicians, of composers, how much you would know. Imagine if you would work on a business, on some business that you want to develop every day for an hour. Imagine how further along you will go and get. So it drives me nuts because we have, when people say we don't have the time, we have 24 hours a day. We sleep six hours a day, so it gives you still 18 hours. Now there's someone shaking their head out here in front to say probably, I don't sleep six hours, I sleep eight hours, right? <laughs> or just sleep faster. So we have 18 hours a day, the average person works around 8 to 10 hours. So let's assume it's 10 hours, so we have 8 hours left. Then you travel around an hour a day, maybe 2 hours a day. So now you have still 6 hours left. So what do you do with these 6 hours? What do you do with these 6 hours? Then we eat a little bit, then we schmooze a little bit, <laughs> talk a little bit to people and all that stuff but you can see how much time there is available if you organize your day. So you got to work hard. I mean, let me tell you something. When I went to America, I went to college. I went and worked out five hours a day. And I was working on construction. Because in those days in bodybuilding, there was no money. We didn't, I didn't have the money for food supplements or anything. So I had to go to work. So I worked in construction. I went to college. I worked out in the gym. And at night, from 8 o'clock at night to 12 midnight, I went to acting class four times a week. So I did all that. There was not one single minute that I wasted. And this is why I'm standing here today.
I became very friendly with Muhammad Ali in the 70s. And Muhammad Ali worked his butt off. And I saw it firsthand. And I remember that there was a sports writer that was there in the gym when he was working out and he was doing sit-ups. And they asked him, how many sit-ups do you do? And he said, I don't start counting until it hurts. Now think about that. He doesn't start counting his sit-ups until he feels pain. That's when he starts counting. That is working hard. And so you can't get around the hard work. It doesn't matter who it is. As a matter of fact, I believe what uh, Ted Turner said, work like hell and advertise. You get it? Work like hell, go to bed, and early, early to rise, work like hell and advertise. So you work your ass off, and then you let the world know about your work. That's what it is all about. Let people know if you have a company, if you have a movie, if you do a sports, work your ass off, but then advertise and let everyone know. I hate plan B. <laughs> and I tell you why. Because we have so many doubters, as I've said earlier, the, the no-sayers. We have so many of those people that say no and you can't do it, and it's impossible. That is okay because we just turn off, as I said earlier, and we listen and we hear the no being a yes, you can't do it, do it, you can do it, and all of that. So that, that is possible to do that amongst all the negative people around you. But when you start doubting yourself, that's very dangerous. Because now what you're basically saying is, is that if my plan doesn't work, I have a fallback plan, I have a plan B. And that means that you start thinking about plan B and every thought that you put into plan B, you're taking away now that thought and that energy from plan A. And And it's very important to understand that we function better if there is no safety net, because plan B becomes a safety net. It says that if I fail, then I fall and I get picked up and I have something else there that, was, that will protect me. And that's not good, because people perform better when there's no safety net. People perform better in sports and everything else if you don't have a plan B. I'm telling you, I've never ever had a plan B. I say I made a full commitment that I'm gonna go and be a bodybuilding champion. I made a full commitment that I'm gonna be in America. I made a full commitment that I'm gonna get into show business and I'm going to be a leading man. No matter what it takes, I will do the work. I will do the work over and over and over until I get it. And the same was in politics and everything like that. So to me, it is very dangerous to have a plan B because you're cutting yourself off from the chance of really succeeding. And the reason, one of the main reasons why people want to have a plan B is because they are worried about failing. What is if I fail, then I don't have anything else? Well, let me tell you something. Don't be afraid of failing because there's nothing wrong with failing. You have to fail in order to climb that ladder. There's no one that doesn't fail. Michael Jordan said in one of his interviews, when they said, you are unbelievable, you're the greatest basketball player of all times. I mean, tell me about that. And he says, well, you're just mentioning the successes. But he says, for me to become the greatest basketball player, I missed 9,000 shots when I was playing basketball at the NBA games. So during these games that he was so successful, he missed 9,000 shots. 
Does it make him a failure? No. He's one of the greatest basketball players of all times, but he failed 9,000 times. Do you get it? We all fail. It's okay. What is not okay is that when you fail, you stay down. Whoever stays down is a loser. And winners will fail and get up. Fail and get up. Fail and get up. You always get up. That is a winner. That is a winner. I failed in bodybuilding. I've, I've, I lost bodybuilding competitions. I lost powerlifting competitions. I lost weightlifting competitions. I had movies that went in the toilet and that were terrible and got the worst reviews. And in politics, I remember, I had many of the initiatives on the ballot and we lost. My approval rating in California went down to 28%. And then it went back up again, and they won again the governorship. Hey, we all lose. We all have losses. This is okay. And this is why I say don't be worried about losing, because when you're afraid of losing, then you get frozen. You get stiff. You're not relaxed. You got to be, in order to perform well in anything, if it's in boxing or if it is on your job or with your thinking, it's only happening when you relax. So relax. It's okay to fail. Let's just go all out and give it everything that you got. That's what it is all about. So don't be afraid to fail. You can only feel complete as a person if you think about what can you do for your fellow member around you that maybe needs help. I felt like that everyone has a different motivation. Why you get into that? I, I was an immigrant going to America, and I saw how America was the most generous country in the world. I mean, they opened up their arms to me, they helped me, they invited me for Thanksgiving dinner, the people, they brought me, uh, the bodybuilders in the gym brought me blades to my apartment because I had no blades, I had no silverware, I had no bedware, I had no pillows, I had no blanket, I had no TV, I had no radio, I had nothing. They brought it to my apartment. They helped me. And I saw that firsthand, this generosity in America. And I said to myself, as an immigrant that is being embraced with open arms, that I need to go and make sure that I give something back. That because I started thinking about how did America become such a great country? How did America become such a generous country? What, I look back in history and I realized that people have fought for America and people have died for America and people have suffered for America. And so it's my job now to contribute, to keep it as being the number one country in the world. And this is when I started feeling obligated and I said to myself, so what can I do? I'm a bodybuilder, what can I do? Well, then I realized when I saw Special Olympics that I can help and train Special Olympians. And so we started getting involved in Special Olympics and in no time, I proposed to them to start powerlifting in Special Olympics, to have deadlift, which was a safe thing to do, and to have bench press, which was a safe thing to do. And it became the number one sports in Special Olympics, powerlifting. They always have a packed hall of 5,000 people. And I became the national trainer and the international trainer of Special Olympics. And I tell you, I felt so good. I felt better than winning a bodybuilding competition, going to one of their competitions and seeing a hundred of those athletes from all over the world competing in powerlifting and being happy and being included and being felt that they're equal to all of us. It was the most unbelievable feeling, and this is why I got so excited about it that then after that, I started you know, going around to military bases in America and training our military personnel. 
Because in those days, bodybuilding and weight training wasn't popular. Now it is. Now when you go to Iraq, to Baghdad or somewhere like that, and you see the American soldiers train, they have the biggest facilities. It's like this, this dome here. This is how big the facility, the training facilities are now. So it all changed. But in those days, there was, it wasn't popular at all. So I went from military base to military base to train the soldiers and the sailors and the airmen and all of them. And it made me feel good again. And then after when I met President Bush, then Vice President Bush, and we traveled around to campaign, he asked me what I want to do. And I said, I would like to be a fitness leader in America. I would like to be the chairman of the President's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports. And then when he became president, he appointed me to that. And so now I really was able to travel through all 50 states and promote health and fitness. And the more I got into that, the more I realized how good it feels to give something back. And that's when my idea came about, about after school programs, because after school, when I traveled to all the schools to train students, I saw there was a huge gathering of students after the school was over outside the school. And I asked the school principal, what are all the students doing? And he said to me, Arnold, you have to understand that 70% that the kids in our school, they come from parents where 70% of the parents are both working. So therefore, there's no one there picking them up. So that's got me the idea to start after school programs, to keep these kids in school while the parents are working and to offer them homework assistance, tutoring, and sports and fitness programs and arts programs, music and painting and so on. And it became a huge success. <laughs> So as you know, it becomes addictive. So it becomes addictive. So then when, of course, when they became very successful, and now we have after-school programs all over the United States. Then, of course, when uh, 2003 happened, where there was a governor's race in California, I said to myself, now is my chance to jump in there and to really give everything. And people said to me, he says, are you crazy to run for governor? When you're governor, he says, you cannot go and make movies anymore. I said, well, duh. I mean, I know that, that you can't run the state and make movies. Of course not. He says, well, you would lose all these millions of dollars. I mean, you're getting 20, 25, 30 million dollars a movie. You will lose that. And I say, I don't care. I say, all the money that I made is because of America. My success is because of America. Everything that I've accomplished is because of America. I said, so for me now to give something back for seven years and not to make money, Makes no difference to me. I say, I'm going to do it. And I jumped in the end of the race and did it. And let me tell you something. I'm not poor because those seven years I didn't get paid. I'm perfectly fine. And it made me feel good that I could give back, give back to America. We need help. We need help. I remember that everything I did I always needed help. Think about it when someone says, Arnold, you're the greatest self-made man. I said, you can call me anything you want. You can call me Arnie, you can call me Schwarzy, you can call me Terminator, you can call me Governator, but don't ever call me self-made man. I said, because I did not get to that point by myself. I mean, think about just to be successful in the movies. How are, you, how are you going to be successful in the movies without having an audience? The only one that makes you successful in the movie is, is the people that go to see the movie. So how can you say to yourself, made man, when you need millions and millions and millions of people all over the world to go and see your movies? So people in the press looks at it and says, this guy has a big box of his success. It's the people. It's you. Imagine if Jürgen and I both think that we're self-made people and this hall right now is empty. No one here. Do you think this will be a successful conference? No. Who makes it successful is not him and me. We are just one little molecule that is added to the equation. But you are the ones 
that make this conference a successful conference. So thank you all of you for being here today. You are the ones that is making it big.